Today I'm making a pair of fancy French drawers for my ongoing Victorian wardrobe project, and I may have a few things to say about the pattern industry. We'll get to that in a moment, but first, is it just me or does it feel like our modern summer wardrobe is just made up out of Edwardian underwear? I mean, the chemise is a much fussier undershirt, the corset is currently making a comeback as a trendy fashion accessory, and the corset cover and drawers are a fancy tank top and ultra cottage core pair of walking shorts. I won't say no to another tank and I could really use a pair of walking shorts. My Victorian outfit won't be complete without the rest of the underwear. Let's start with some French drawers, shall we? I have five meters of white cotton fabric bought at a fabric store sometime last year when I first started planning this project. Part of this cotton will go into the corset cover, but drawers will take up the lion's share of the fabric. For this project, I'm using Truly Victorian's TVE02 Edwardian underwear. You might be wondering why, since I had trouble with the chemise from this package. The instructions were pretty sparse, but a lot of the issue came down to my own lack of experience and inability to interpret those instructions. As I mentioned in my last corset video, there's something to be said for approaching a project from the more experienced perspective. Also, Truly Victorian has a Facebook group, and I'm pretty sure I can ask for help if I find myself too far into the weeds. That's some big brain energy right there. I've had a chance to look over their instructions and get an idea of the process. I even measured, which is how I know I'm going to have to enlarge the pattern. There's some gathering on both the drawers and the corset cover, so I could just add an extra inch or two to the waistbands and gather a little bit less. I'll probably do that with the corset cover. However, ease, particularly around the midsection, is important in case I'm not lacing as tightly one day for one reason or another, or if I want to wear the drawers under the corset for aesthetic reasons. I can always take in the garments if they're too big. Letting things out is where it could get sticky. While I could probably cinch my waist in a little tighter, well, the song says hips don't lie and these babies need a little extra ease. The nice thing about Truly Victorian is they include all the sizes in one package. I'm extremely thankful you don't have to pay per range because this gives you a good idea of what the differences are between each size. This makes it much easier to alter for mid-sizing and to predict for scaling up. I reprinted my drawer pattern to work from and drew out lines from the corners as a guide. Then I used a combination of measuring out and tracing to estimate the next sizes up. So here's the thing. I'm a fairly novice sewist without a lot of experience putting together a pattern, let alone sizing one up. I've attempted this with a Big Four commercial vintage reprint, and the results were somewhat disastrous. Partially because I was trying to make a standard size 22 into a torrid size 3, partially because I hear that particular pattern wasn't reproduced very well and is dodgy even at straight sizes. In this case, because I was just going up two sizes in hopes of getting some ease to work with, the results were a lot better, but there's always a but, right? Costume and historical recreation pattern companies have been one of the front runners when it comes to making plus size patterns. And Truly Victorian's range is by far one of the most inclusive. And yet I can't help thinking that we can do better. I'm not knocking Truly Victorian here. They provided a pattern that goes up to about mid-fat sizing, and that's more than I can say for other pattern makers. They also include all the sizes in their package, so sizing up is not only possible, it's a hell of a lot easier, and again, way more than I can say for other pattern designers. It's one of the reasons why I've actually gone ahead and purchased other Truly Victorian patterns in anticipation of the next garments on my list, rather than trying out another company. Truly Victorian isn't trying to hustle more cash out of me by limiting their pattern sizes. Instead, they're building a good customer relationship with someone who will be more likely to buy other patterns from them in the future, and coincidentally will mention their experience favorably on a major distribution pattern, but that's besides the point. Hashtag not sponsored. 
Some YouTube growth channels recommend you read and reply to all your comments, and some recommend you stop interacting after X amount of hours or days. And I'm one of those folks who, for the time being, has the luxury of reading and replying to comments until the cows come home. So I see when you're recommending I check out a pattern line. I respond when you tell me a popular pattern designer is considering extending their size range. And while that gives me hope, it also makes me a little angry. Angry that our food supply, home economics, education, and available time to cook is bonkers enough that some of us are at an expanded weight to begin with, bearing in mind that a variety of factors other than just eating poorly can contribute to weight gain, but also angry that we rely on and are grateful for these small independent companies extending themselves to catering to us. First, if there are sizes for us in retail stores, shouldn't we be included by default? Most of all, I'm angry that large companies that have the money to put into research and development and design either don't care enough about their customers to adjust for the times and provide quality stylish patterns for mid-fat to infinifat people at reasonable prices, or they figure we'll be happy with a few frumpy sack dresses and elastic-waisted pairs of slacks. I've seen some of the offerings, some of the recommendation of my viewers, and while I'm glad there are options, they kind of look dismal. I mean, are you really happy with dismal frumpy sack dresses and trousers or tunic tops without any personality or shaping? I'm not. Let's be honest here. Raise your hand if you were forced into buying frumpy clothing meant for elderly women when you were in your teens, 20s, or 30s because Torrid and the Reitman's Canada Plus Size Cartel weren't an actual thing yet. Or you lived in a location that didn't, or still doesn't, have access to these retail locations. Leave a comment down below. I want to add your voice on the matter just on the off chance a large pattern company actually sees this. Having a mother who was a sewist, I was raised with the propaganda that if we couldn't find clothes to fit in the store, we could always sew it. That this was the beauty of making your own clothing. We'd just buy the next size up of a similar fashion and alter as needed. That's great if you're a size 18 and working from a pattern that ends at a size 16, but how do you get a torrid size 3, let alone a 4 to 6, from a pattern that stops at a small standard size 22 and maybe includes three sizes in the range? Even better, McCall's at least has started slipping clothing up to a size 32W into their collection, but offerings are few and there's no way to tell at a glance which of their plus size patterns go up to this range. As it is, most of the plus size pattern pictures still feature slender models. So if I can't size the pattern up, and I can't figure out which patterns may actually fit me or flatter me, or be alterable to the next size up, what use is it? Absolutely none. Hey big name pattern companies, this isn't a problem with plus size people wanting to buy plus size patterns or not. It's a problem with your business model. If you make attractive plus-size patterns with actual plus-size models in the picture, and you make the size ranges easy to find and filter, I guarantee you'll get a return on your investment. Particularly if you can leverage some of the internet sewists to promote your brand. There's a reason linen is on the uptick, and while you could blame svelte little Instagram models scampering around in fields, it's partially because almost every popular costumer on YouTube is making frilly cottagecore dresses. You want fabric stores to start carrying more than quilting supplies and make sewing clothing cool again? Give patterns to people who will actually use them. Don't just bury a couple of extended range patterns in with your already obscured plus sizes and blame the customer for not buying them. It's a bad look. Almost as bad as the illusion that to make your own clothes and have them fit well, you have to lose weight. As I alluded in my food desert rant, even if you make the decision today to lose weight at a pace that is healthy for you, and that's supposing you want to lose weight and aren't perfectly comfortable the way you already are, Yeah, all right. there's no guarantee the clothes you like are going to fit you tomorrow, because that would be way too easy. For those trolls who might slide into the comments to inform us that we should limit dress sizes to discourage folks from gaining weight, what planet are you on? First off, it's none of your business what size a person wants to be, or whether they've had a lifelong struggle with their weight. If you're a fatphobic troll, you're probably already perfectly well aware of this and are just trying to cause senseless drama for your own amusement. 
your God. Second, the point isn't to use clothing to encourage or discourage, but to clothe the people who are already there with style and dignity, not to punish them for merely existing. As it is, as a fat person, it's been my experience that I spend a lot more time thinking about my clothing than many of my thinner counterparts who are just concerned with what's in this year. I was raised with the advice that vertical lines make you look taller and horizontal lines make you look wider. I was raised to wear my shirts untucked, tunic style, to draw less attention to my midsection. I learned how to look for classic styles in my clothing. Because if your weight fluctuates at all, it's easier to fall back on or replace a classic than have to rely on something trendy from five years ago that just happens to be the only dress in your closet that fits right now. Most important, does it fit? Whether I was a teenager at the mall with friends, or an adult trying on clothing with the husbeast waiting outside the change room to help with straps or back zippers, I've still come home from the store in tears because a store that promised it had clothing to fit me in reality did not. I'm looking directly at the folks who thought all jeans should be skinny jeans, and thus the only kind of trousers that should be stocked. Bonus points if they're butt crack bearing hip huggers. Don't get me started. There's a special circle of hell for you. Above all, I see young people right now trying to do the thing I've always wanted to do. Dress the way I feel inside and come up against the exact same roadblocks, heartache, and frustration I faced 30 years ago. But now with an extra dash of guilt for having to fall back on fast fashion to get that cottagecore strega or dark academy look when it's available. When other straight-sized girls are ordering from sustainable clothing shops on the internet that don't cater to extended plus sizes or repurposing vintage patterns and sizes that don't match today's inflated vanity sizing. So, thank you truly, Victorian, for giving me the ability to make the most cottagecore underwear I will probably ever own. I really do appreciate it with all my heart. It's a great start. We need to do better. I was supposed to be sewing something, right? Let's do that. I did my cutting out off screen in the dinette upstairs because my wee table down here is just too wee. And I don't have enough space to floor troll it Rachel Maxey style down here. We're still sorting out books and other media to take to the used bookstore. Honestly, I cut out two thirds of the pattern and went to bed with a sore back and a headache from hunching over the table and spent the next day recovering from the resulting migraine and possibly rethinking my life choices. So it's taken me a while to get over the trauma and face the frilly cotton undies again. I'm actually trying to follow the directions here. The front and back crotch facings threw me for a loop. The way I interpret it is I'm supposed to pin the facing to the opening right sides together. Press, clip, and turn. Now the problem comes after pressing the outer edge of the facing under. Do you top stitch closer to the folded seam at the opening or do you top stitch the facing down at the folded outer edge? I'm not taking any chances, so I'm going to top stitch near the folded seam edge and use a hem stitch to tack down the facing. I had a dim memory of having to do this in the past and confirmed with mum that this was acceptable. I only modified this step a teensy bit by folding and ironing the edge pre-seaming. It was a little easier to maneuver around while ironing in a very small space and turned under very nicely while I was giving everything its final press after clipping. The flounces went together fairly easily. You stitch the four pieces together in a loop, then seam them to the rest of the leg. I had a little trouble attaching the flounces though, they just weren't lining up properly, which was a little frustrating. I had to let them out about a quarter of an inch on each seam to get things to line up. While I was ripping out the old flounce seams, I took the time to tack down the drawer facings. I don't know about you, but I'm impressed. Hemming and tacking on trim took the longest amount of time. I probably could have assembled the drawers to the waistband and then hemmed, but it was easier to work on each pant leg separately. If I make these again, I might say to hell with it and just top stitch the hem with the trim into place, 
this was a lot of hand stitching. The upshot to this is that if I decide I want to change out the lace, in theory, all I'd need to do is spend an evening with a glass of wine and a seam ripper and not worry about re-hemming the whole kit and caboodle. Of course, it was only when I was starting to assemble the legs in the waistband that I realized I'd made two left legs. Easy enough to fix, the issue is with the top half. The flounces for both legs are the same, so I detached them from the leg and reseamed everything as intended. Before attaching everything to the waistband, I ran a couple of rows of gathering stitches within the seam allowance, so gathering the seat area as marked would be easier. The instructions were kind of minimal when it comes to this step, so I'm glad I'd used the technique previously to gather the yoke of my chemise. From there, the waistband was pretty simple. Sew legs to the waistband, turn edges in, and stitch into place. You could probably top stitch it, but I chose to tack it down by hand so I could maximize the area available for my buttonhole. Which I also did by hand, because the waistband was just thick enough I knew my sewing machine would have issues. Might have also been showing off. I thought this project would only take me a day or two of work and I'd be presenting both a corset cover as well as the French drawers, and I was very wrong. <laughs> Between resizing the pattern and hand sewing lace trim, it was considerably longer. It was worth it though, and if I need to size down I have that option. I also think that if I need to remake the pattern it will go a lot faster. Again, that's speaking from a position of experience. There's some flexibility in the pattern, so if I found a nice insertion lace and wanted to get utterly ridiculous, it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility to find half the garment replaced with little peekaboo windows of starched cotton. Hit the like button down below if this idea amuses you even half as much as it already entertains me. While it may be in poor taste, I haven't totally ruled out expanding on my chemise decorating video with an episode titled Pimp My Underpants. Till then. Yeah.